What are clothes? Don't worry, it's not a trick question. They're something you wear, right? Or what if they were something that you made? In 2020, I made this 40 before 40 resolutions list where I said, make an item of clothing from scratch that I would actually wear. I've been watching a lot of girls on YouTube who make clothes. And I'm not saying that it doesn't look incredibly hard, but it doesn't look undoable. <laughs> then, very unexpectedly, I got trapped in my top floor flat and I bought a child's sewing machine. I started sewing and, well, I haven't looked back. I'm by no means a fashion designer. I've probably made about five things myself so far, but I'm completely addicted. And I realized that I didn't really know anybody else in my life who was also trying to make their own clothes. Before I started doing it myself, I had loads of assumptions about it, loads of lies I felt the world had told me about what it was like to make my own wardrobe. And the lessons I learned along the way aren't just relevant for people who are sewists or knitters, they're relevant for anybody who has a wardrobe. So if you have a wardrobe and you're feeling curious, here are some lies I was told about making my own clothes. Lie number one, clothes are made by machines. It's really, really common to assume that and I understand why you would, I used to think that. And then I was like, one day maybe I'll have a handmade wardrobe all for myself. How bougie would that be? And now I wanna shake my past self and be like, you already have a handmade wardrobe. It's just the reason that you're able to have so much of it is because the hands that made the wardrobe are a little bit exploited. And by a little bit, I mean um, quite a lot. Machines are part of the clothes making process quite a lot, they can print fabric, they can cut fabric, and if you're in a fancy factory, they can even fold fabric, but they cannot attach fabric together in the shapes of clothes. It's just not a thing that is mostly happening. Sewing is something that's notoriously really hard to automate because when you put fabric under the charge of a machine, it doesn't tend to notice when it bunches up or can't guide the stretch of a fabric through a machine's needle correctly. Human hands can guide fabric and judge when something goes wrong in a way that machines just can't. Now, knitting, which is what I'm doing now, can actually, depressingly, be done by a machine. Reassuring. But as far as I can tell, you still need a human operating that machine. And also you need human hands to assemble a garment. For example, this, believe it or not, is going to be the front of a cardigan. A machine could probably do this, but it couldn't take the other side and the sleeves and the back and carefully align and assemble those with like a blanket stitch or something. It just can't do that. The more I learn about fast fashion and high street clothes that I have been buying for the first half of my life, it kind of makes me open my wardrobe in a different way and look at the clothes that I own and think about how many hands have touched those clothes before me and how many of those hands were attached to bodies that were having nice lives and nice days and, you know, smoke breaks. Fuck a smoke break, even a biscuit break. Half a rich tea. And I mean, uh, pff, we don't have time to go into it here, but crochet. Heard about crochet? Huge upsurgence in the popularity of crochet at the moment. And the prices of those crochet items are mad when you realize it is physically impossible to get a machine to do crochet. Every little hook has to be done by a human hand. I'll leave the links below, but it's literally impossible. What? I have been making this cardigan for what feels like approximately 10 years. And I looked up to pay somebody to make this garment. It will cost me 300 pounds. And now I'm halfway through, I'm starting to see why. Our weird Western fetish with wanting distressed jeans and distressed denim is another like Pandora's box of problems that I didn't even know was a thing. Wanting jeans that look worn actually takes a lot of work. Being the person who has to sandblast jeans has loads of health risks and like loads of people have died from scoliosis and lung related disease from doing that job. Also that we can buy jeans that are new but look old when there's loads of old jeans actually in the world already. <laughs> Look, that's the bad news. The good news is it hasn't always been like that. It's very recent that it's been that way. And I predict that it won't be like that in the future. Would you like to join in? Good. Then let's talk about lie number two. You need a lot of money to make your own clothes. Now, honestly, like anything, you can either make this very, very cheap or very, very expensive. So I'm going to give you three scenarios. Scenario one, you borrow a sewing machine from somebody you know slash somebody in the family who has one and never uses it. I've heard that's a thing. There was nobody in my family who had one, but no ASCII, no Getty. Or depending where you live, you can look at your local lending library and see if you can borrow one. For materials, you use old bed sheets 
or curtains either sourced from within inside your house or you can do a call out on social media to your friends and family to see if there's anything they want to get rid of. Duvet covers are pretty useful and I've been using them myself quite a lot. And for extra tools you can thrift thread and pins. I've seen them a lot on Depop and Vinted but I've also found some in my local charity shops. It's always worth rummaging around. This option will cost a maximum I would say of three pounds. Option two, you rent a sewing machine for a week, 20 pounds. You buy a secondhand duvet cover or tablecloth from Vinted or Depop or a local charity shop, 10 pounds maximum. You get your threads and needles from your local supermarket, Tesco do it, Asda do it, Sainsbury's do it. I'm talking maximum two pounds. Total cost, 32 pounds. And duvet covers are big, you can potentially get more than one garment out of that. Option three, and I'm gonna veer on the generous side for this one. You can buy a sewing machine like I have. This one was 145 pounds, but Hobbycraft also have ones for 50 pounds and 60 pounds that seem to do very similar things to this one. And of course, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll know that I started with a child sewing machine, which was 20 pounds in total, including thread. You buy the fabric from your local haberdashery. This lovely licorice all sorts dress I made Made, cost 18 pounds in fabric total. That was for three meters because I had a really swirly, swishy dress, but you can have a one meter or two meter garment easily. You buy the nicer, swishier, 100% cotton thread, two pounds. And instead of sewing pins, you get sewing clips one with three pounds. Total cost 168 pounds, although that number is very deceptive because if you continue to sew, the cost per item goes down exponentially. Knitting often has rock bottom startup costs. I got my secondhand needles for a pound each from charity and thrift shops, ditto, wool, lots of that in secondhand charity shops that is, hasn't been used, one or two pounds per ball at most. And then of course there's the argument in investment pieces like this or in just literally investing in some needles that you'll be able to make your clothes last longer, whether that's fixing knitted garments that have unraveled or hemming, patching, repairing clothes that you already own. Yes, sewing machines can be expensive, but I don't think we should use the words expensive and unaffordable interchangeably here. If you'd like to see my video talking about my definition of what affordable is, which is a movable feast, let me tell you. And we don't have time to unpack it here, but the video about that is up there. But just for argument's sake, this is my machine, it was 145 pounds, right? The average household in the UK spends 750 for pounds on clothes and footwear. And with that, I am using the lower figures of 2020 to 2021 when it was 38% down um, on other years because obviously people weren't leaving the house as much. It's probably way higher than that again now. Machines can last up to 20 years or more if you look after them. They're not like tablets or digital products. They don't have that planned obsolescence element to them. You can replace the parts pretty easily. And mine is mechanical, so there's no software updates or elements that will outdate it. And comparable for that price, I'd say things that are normal to buy in middle income households in my country, £344 for an average football season ticket, £130 for a lower range smartphone from Argos, £159 for a TV license. I'd say £145 would probably get you about four women's haircuts. It's the same price as an air fryer. How many people have you met recently that are raving about their air fryers? Or perhaps a pair of GHD hair straighteners. Obviously that doesn't universally apply to everybody, but I think it probably applies to enough people for it to be worth mentioning. When you reprogram your mind and think that it's the same price as say like a lawnmower and clothes are inarguably more essential than lawnmowers. If you go outside without any clothes on, it's illegal. Having a nice lawn is, well, actually, it's actually really genuinely not good for the planet at all. It's not ideal. It's not, not only a luxury, but it's kind of depleting the resources we have. Anyway, it's another, it's another video. It's another video. We don't have time. Keep moving. <laughs> Safe to say, getting started with sewing has a low barrier to entry. And as you realise that maybe it's something you'd like to pursue, it's very comparable to any other hobby or household essential item. Lie number three you need a lot of space to make your own clothes. Now, if you've been a keen viewer of the channel for a while, you will know, for the nerds among you, I'm making infinity binding, by the way, you might know that I learned to sew on this little tiny shelf desk. It's so cute. I actually measured it for you. It's 80 centimeters by 45 centimeters. And while it was cramped, it was possible. 
I now mainly work on this table, which is 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters, which is still under a meter square. When I first learned to sew, I didn't have an ironing board. I literally just used a towel and this travel iron and just ironed on my heat proof kitchen counters. Now, as you can tell, I've got this ironing board, which is very exciting, but obviously I don't need to have it up all the time. So I just have it up in the living room when I'm using it. And sometimes I get this flashy cutting board and I can extend the side of my ironing board so I can sketch stuff out or draw stuff out or measure stuff on this as well, which is kind of cool. It kind of expands what this ironing board is for. The thing with TV programs that show sewing or even specialized sewing channels on YouTube is that they're showing professional studios or separate rooms in their house that they've set aside for sewing because it's their job. That room is nice to have if sewing is your job or you have a business set around sewing, but if you're sewing for yourself, you really don't need that much room. I think the only exception to this is probably Jenna Phipps. If you don't watch her, you should, but she also works in a very small space and shows how possible it is. When it comes to storing materials, I I'm trying to be anti-stash. For example, I'm trying to only have as much fabric in the house as I need for my next one or two projects. That is hard when you like to thrift secondhand duvets, which is what this is, because sometimes two really cool ones come up at once and then you gotta jump on them. But just as an example, this is what I keep all of my sewing equipment in. The only other thing that I use for storage is my sewing machine bag. I tuck some extra wool underneath this flashy little side table, but apart from that, that's the extent of the storage that I use in this house. Can you believe this? This used to be my makeup bag. <laughs> <laughs> and makeup has gone on the back burner for me. I no longer care. This is this is my main hobby bag. It's serving a much better purpose now and I'm so happy. Obviously, it would be cool to have like a separate space just for sewing or a studio, but I don't think it really affects the quality of your sewing or the amount that you're gonna enjoy it. So if it's space that's holding you back, I genuinely don't think you need to worry. This is starting to take shape. Lie number four, you need a lot of time to make your own clothes. I recognize that not everybody has the same hours in the day as Beyonce. So I'm gonna just talk personally here and not to call myself out, but absolutely to call myself out. Here's my screen time from yesterday. Literally the time that I spent on my phone. Now I kind of have a bugbear about people over emphasizing the criticism of of spending time on your phone because I do feel like in a lot of cases it's time where I don't have the brain to, I don't know, learn chess or organize a protest or invest in Bitcoin. This is very much time when my brain is not at its full capacity. Newsflash though, that also happens to be the mode in which I could totally knit. It's a kind of mindless and yet present meditation that I could go on about all day. You've probably seen my knitting video where I taught myself to knit in 24 hours and thereafter discovered the borderline spiritual benefits of knitting. But it's also worth noting that all the sewing that I've done on my channel so far has been done outside of work hours. The only video where I use my work hours to sew was when I was making this advent calendar dungarees, remember them? Yeah, I took that really seriously. <laughs> Too seriously, some might say, not me though. But suffice to say, sewing and making my own wardrobe isn't my job. A lot of the time I'm doing it in wee evenings and weekends, five or 10 minute little jobbies here and there when I'm taking a screen break because I am lucky enough to work from home. So there is that. I don't drive, so you'll often find me knitting on the bus or the train or while I'm having a conversation with somebody or before breakfast when my brain isn't completely awake, but it is awake enough to do a little bit of ironing or a little bit of pinning. But yes, it is worth noting, making your own clothes does take time. And for some people that isn't possible. I completely get that. But for a lot of us, we do take for granted the fact that maintaining our garden or cleaning our flat or our house or, or getting some maintenance done on our car, they're all things that we accept are just part of being an adult. And we defend and carve out and find time for those things because we realize it's socially acceptable to do so. And also because to own it, we also have to carve time out to maintain it and look after it. I've been working really hard to adjust just that mindset, copy and paste it, a mindset I already have, and copy and paste it into my wardrobe. All the boring utilitarian parts of life do need time allocated to them. And lucky for me, I find wardrobe maintenance so much better than hoovering. And you know, I'm working on filing it under an essential part of my life because among many other things, it is still illegal to be naked. So I do actually need clothes. <laughs> It is 
hard. I definitely thought that about sewing before I started. I thought, that would be nice, but it's not for me. And then I ended up putting it on my 40 before 40 goals list and started throwing myself into trying to learn. And I realized that it's actually only as hard as you make it. I'd say that while it is a skill and it can take a lifetime to master being, I don't know, Alexander McQueen, it is a scalable skill and being able to do the basics can be quite fast. You probably have already used some of these skills already. For example, have you ever cut around something? Snipped in a craft setting or even wrapping a Christmas present? You must have snipped around an object before. Any object, have you planned how something would be assembled, I don't know, maybe by assembling flat pack furniture or rearranging a room in your flat. I would say it's actually kind of comparable to assembling Ikea furniture, except it has better instructions and you already have all of the pieces. I'd say the beginner's skill of knitting is comparable to learning how to plait hair or tie a shoelace. For some of us, that was a very long time ago, but it doesn't mean that at the beginning it wasn't a bit of a mindfuck. <laughs> and now it's like breathing, you don't even think about it. And I can't even begin to tell you how much easier it is than driving a car. And how many people in the UK drive a car right now? You're saving resources rather than spending them and also the stakes are considerably lower. I don't think anybody has died from using a sewing machine. If you get it wrong, you can just unpick it. Tell that to the AA insurance man. Lie number six, sewing will save the planet. I don't think that if everybody starts sewing their own clothes, we're magically gonna be able to clock off from climate change and be like, don't worry lads, solved. I'm not under those kind of delusions. What I do think it will do, even if you learn and you don't continue to do it regularly, is to make you a more conscious consumer. Perfect demonstration, just did, just massively fucked this up. And do you know what? That actually does make me a more conscious consumer because I have started to genuinely understand the mastery and hours that goes into making something that I used to very casually wear on my body. I don't have my bastard pin now, do I? The rage when you get something wrong, I don't even, anyway. Is this a therapy dupe? I mean, jump scare pop quiz. What is the root cause of the climate crisis? Yes, very good, capitalism. But let's level up for a second. I think the root cause of the climate crisis is disconnection. Disconnection from each other, disconnection from the objects that we interact with every day. And I can honestly say that learning to sew has connected me more to the objects in my life that were once inanimate and now feel a little bit more animated. It also makes me think really hard about the stuff that I buy because even though I'm just buying the raw materials, it still costs a lot of money and it costs a lot of time. So I'm not gonna casually be like, maybe I'll try that and see if it works in my wardrobe. I'm seriously like, Will this work with literally everything I have ever owned? Am I gonna love this dress forever? What kind of occasions am I gonna wear it to? Because when you're sinking 10 to 30 hours of your own limited God-given life, you're gonna be a bit picky about which kind of green fabric you finally buy, you know? Now the fabric that sewists use for sewing is often very similar to the stuff that you would find in a fast fashion garment. You can pick more conscious fabrics. For example, this is secondhand linen, but they all have their own complications. And I will hold up my hands and say, me made garments aren't without their own carbon footprint. However, a lot of the waste that is created from unethical and unsustainable fast fashion is in the moving the clothes and the resources between countries. When I learned about that, my mind was blown too. But say for example, you can have a fabric dyed in one country, shipped to another country where it's cut, shipped to another country where the labor for that particular thing is cheaper, where it's sewn, and then ship to another country for them to fit the buttons and the zips. Your wardrobe is probably way more well-traveled than any asshole that you met on a gap year called Joshua, who's been to like everywhere, you are. Fabrics that people do sew with, like Raylon, Lysel, Viscose, like seven million trees are logged every year to make that stuff. And there is a lot of plastic in fabric. If you go into just a local wool shop, you're likely, if you look on the back of a lot of the wool, you're likely to see that it's actually polyester. You're literally just knitting with plastic. The Closet Historian did an amazing video breaking down the reality of waste from sewing and it was a really interesting nuanced take so I'd really encourage you to watch that video. But I personally would be relieved to live in a world where it was sewists who were the problem when it comes to consumption and the planet. And I do think that being anti-stash is important and just like with book buying, <laughs> calling out myself, buying sewing materials 
and sewing are two different hobbies, not necessarily connected. And according to Judith B. Shaw, who wrote The New Economics of True Wealth, an average American, and you know, what's the phrase? <laughs> when the US sneezes, Britain gets a cold. The average American consumes three times as much as their ancestors did 50 years ago, and twice as much as the people 20 years ago. In 1991, the average person bought 34 items of clothing a year, and by 2007 they were buying 67 items. So, get it? So, if I can make 37 items of clothing this year, I'd still be just back to what we were doing 50 years ago. No? I also find that like with not eating meat, it does start a conversation. It's a great soft opener if you wanna to talk to people about how worried you are about the planet without preaching to them, but just sharing how you feel. Cause I know from my experience, I find that really, really hard and clothes are an amazing conversation starter. Like how often do you just tell people about where you bought something or whether it was on sale or whether it's got pockets? What if you could tell them a little bit more about how you feel about your clothes? and why you started making them. I think that that is a really interesting aspect of sewing as somebody who's also worried about the environment. To sum up, I'm aware that sewing isn't the whole solution, but I will defend the fact that it's part of the solution till the death. Lie number seven. Now you know everything that's in this video, you are morally obliged to make your own clothes. There's no getting out of it. You heard. No, don't worry. The revolution does not mean upskilling in every area and making sure you can make everything that you consume. Now, not to sound like a freaking socialist, but logistically, the only way this is gonna work is if we are allowed to be part of a body of people who collectively know how to make what they need. And maybe none of this is your skill set. Maybe you're meant to balance the books or grow gherkins or learn how to heal bodies. I, for one, like sewing and knitting so much that if one of my friends was like, I will spend 40 hours batch cooking vegan meals for you. If you spend 40 hours knitting me a bright pink neon cardigan, I would 100% take them up on that because look, I need to eat. I know I need to eat. Just like I can't be naked, I need to wear clothes, but God damn am I bad at cooking. So the message of this video isn't, I can't believe you don't sew. More, as we recover from the last 200 years of trend setting fuckery on the planet and we start to return to more rational, logical ways of looking at consumption, there will be a, people around you who wanna sew. And if you don't wanna be one of those people, it's worth thinking about what skill sets you can acquire or already have so that when everything collapses, <laughs> this is why people don't invite me to dinner parties, isn't it? <laughs> Forever cheery. When everything collapses, you have a swap skill, joyful, fulfilling thing that you can assemble or build from scratch or provide. So we can move from a culture of slapped wrists to like fun summer camp swapsies, rainbows and smiles. Oh, I don't know. Socialism. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, you might like some of these videos. This video was made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. And if you want to see some of my me made clothes in action or follow the journey of me making that cardigan, you can follow me on Instagram at Lena Norms. How do you think the fashion industry serves you and your wardrobe and how could they do better? Or if you've got a story about learning to make your own clothes, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. That is all from me, Frog Snog out.